So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this being Friday, which is a day in which the uh, library closes earlier than it does normally, we're going to go ahead and get started. I realize, uh, and I apologize for the construction-related parking difficulties several of you have probably already experienced, and I expect several others who would otherwise be occupying these seats are currently experiencing. My own parking space has been relocated to hell and gone, um, so you, you have my condolences. Um, I'm Brian Schottlander, the university librarian here at UC San Diego, and I'm very pleased to welcome you all to Geisel Library this afternoon. Um, we are filming this event, uh, and so there will be an opportunity at the end of the speaker's presentations uh, for about 10, 15 minutes of Q&A. Um, bear with us uh, as we ask you to wait for a microphone to be brought to you. That's totally related to the videotaping so that people who are watching this presentation who are not able to be here today will be able to hear those of you um, asking questions. Uh, we're very honored to be hosting the Chinese and the Iron Road building the transcontinental exhibit that you see out in the foyer. Um, which has been getting a lot of attention and interest on this campus. Um, many of you no doubt know that this campus has one of the highest percentages of Asian students of any university in the country. Uh, in fact, nearly 50% of our undergraduates are of Asian extraction, uh, and of those, a high percentage are Chinese Americans. Do they know about this part of their history? Well, we hope that with this exhibit, um, we can at least help ensure that they do. Uh, before we get started with today's program, um, I do want to recognize several people who have worked very hard to make the exhibit in today's event happen, including Si Chen, our Chinese studies librarian, somewhat newly recruited from Oberlin, I'm happy to say, uh, Sarah Fenraya, our newly recruited academic outreach coordinator, and the entire staff of our communications and engagement program. Um, please join me in thanking them all for their efforts. Um, I would also like to uh, recognize a colleague who is with us from the University of San Diego. Uh, USD, um, and that is Ms. Lee Fu, Assistant Professor and Head of Access and Outreach Services in the USD Libraries, and more relevantly to today's event, the current Executive Director of CALA, the Chinese American Librarians Association. Uh, it is Lee Fu and Si Chen who worked very closely together um, in making this event happen and in bringing the exhibit down south. So again, please join me in thanking them both for their efforts. I want to welcome Hilton Obensinger, the Associate Director of Stanford University's Chinese Railroad Workers Project, um, who we will be hearing from shortly. The exhibit was produced by the Stanford Project in collaboration with the Chinese Historical Association of America and we thank them for their many efforts, A, to bring these issues to light, and B, for welcoming our request to host the exhibit in San Diego. Um, I also want to uh, welcome Murray Lee, the curator of Chinese American history for the San Diego Chinese Historical Museum. Uh, fortunately for us, Murray um, has been at the library for other events, including uh, one a few years ago when he himself gave a talk about his 2012 book, In Search of Gold Mountain. So welcome back, Murray. We're very happy to have you with us for this event. And now I'd like to introduce Simeon Mon, Assistant Professor of History at UC San Diego, who specializes in Asian American history and transnational US history with a particular emphasis on the politics of race and empire. Um, Simeon's first book, which is forthcoming from the University of California Press, is entitled Soldiering Through Empire, Race and the Making of the Decolonizing Pacific, uh, which is a cultural history of the United States military in Asia after World War II, which explains how the US mobilized post-colonial subjects throughout Asia and the Pacific 
for the war in Vietnam, and how in turn this transformed the politics of race, nation, and empire in post-U.S. culture, post-war U.S. culture. Uh, Simeon received his PhD in American Studies from Yale in 2012, and before joining the faculty here at UC San Diego, was an Andrew W. Mellon postdoctoral fellow at Northwestern University, and subsequently a provost's postdoctoral scholar in the humanities at that little institution up north, USC. <laughs> Welcome to the library, Simeon. Uh, thank you for your involvement in today's program. <laughs> Simeon will be introducing our other two speakers, Hilton and Murray, and so let me turn the lectern over to you. Right. Thank you, Brian, and I also want to thank Xi for uh, inviting me to participate in today's event. It's really my pleasure to be here and to speak to all of you. Um, so I just have a... So let me get started with this image. So as you all know, this is a rather well-known image of the Transcontinental Railroad. It's the image commemorating the driving of the last spike on May 10th, 1869 in Promontory Point, Utah. This was the point where the two rails that had been constructed over the past five years um, one from California, the other from Mississippi, finally enjoying. As this photograph attests, the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad was a monumental achievement. One historian called it the greatest public work of the century, certainly without exaggeration. For others, it became synonymous with the American Industrial Revolution not least because it completely revolutionized the uh, very ways of transportation in America. So for example, a trip from Omaha, Nebraska to the Pacific Coast, instead of taking two months by wagon, would now take a mere four days. Aside from cutting the time of transportation significantly, the completion of the railroad also meant that the nation <laughs> was becoming increasingly connected. It completely altered Americans' conceptions of space and time. All, all the cliches that we hear today about globalization, about how the internet age is making the world smaller, the world is becoming more and more connected, I think all of these cliches really began with this moment, with the age of the railroad. In fact, this was the time when the nation became divided into four separate time zones. So all of these changes were happening within the span of five years or so uh, during the construction of the railroad. When it was finished, hundreds of people gathered here at Promontory Point, including politicians, company executives, journalists, and some construction workers, all to commemorate this very significant moment. And the fact that I'm opening my remarks about Chinese workers by talking about this image is perhaps a predictable one because this image in many ways have come to epitomize the exclusion of the Chinese, not only from the construction of the railroad itself, but more broadly from American society in the 19th century. So in reading the absence of the Chinese in this photograph, our impulse as historians is to fill this void, right, to reinsert the Chinese into the historical record or to argue that the Chinese were also there and should be rightfully recognized for their contributions. While I recognize this impulse and I don't want to delegitimize it, I do want to caution us in doing so, so quickly. That is, I think that this image marked by the absent presence of the Chinese actually tells us something quite significant about the role of Asian migrant workers in the making of the American West and the American empire in the 19th century. This other story, this global story of race, labor, and empire in the 19th century would get missed and occluded if we simply wrote the Chinese back into this inclusionary narrative of the American nation. So what I want to do is to caution against this um, narrative of contributions, right? So oftentimes when the Chinese and the railroads are acknowledged at all in secondary school books, um, they get one or two sentences really quickly 
acknowledging, oh, they were there too, right? So I want to caution against this contributions narrative um, in the ways that we talk about the Chinese and the, and the railroads. So one of the things that we often miss when we talk about the Transcontinental Railroad is that American politicians and businessmen wanted to build it not simply because they wanted access to the West Coast or uh, to the American West and the extractive industries that emerged quickly after the California Gold Rush. Right? So indeed, they set their sights even further than the American West. They were thinking about the possibilities of pursuing free trade across the Pacific. So in 1851, the California Senator John Warner said, quote, a railroad from some point on the Mississippi to some point on the Bay of San Francisco is the best route that can be adopted for the purpose of securing the commerce of China and India. <clears throat> Another politician in 1850, uh, 1852 said, and I quote, if this road were completed and the route continued westward to Calcutta, it would reduce the time required for the circuit of the globe to 93 days. So politicians, in other words, were already thinking about reaching far distant lands when they were talking about the construction of the railroad. So indeed, that very same year in 1852, Commodore Matthew Perry was commissioned by President Fillmore on a naval expedition across the Pacific to force open the ports of Japan to American trade. Less than 10 years before that, the United States also secured important concessions from China after the Opium Wars and the Treaty of Nanking uh, that was concluded between China and Britain. So the age of the railroad was also the age of empire, okay? a moment when the United States began to enter the world of imperial competition and began to compete for labor markets overseas. And it's not by coincidence that this was exactly the moment when Asians began migrating to North America. And with each wave of migrants, right, Chinese, Japanese, Indians, Koreans, and Filipinos, with each of these different waves of Asian migrants corresponding to the economic dislocations and violence caused by European and American imperial expansion. So the historian Gary Okihiro has been one of the most persistent in reminding us about the global and imperial origins of Asian American history. As he wrote, quote, Asians, it must be remembered, did not come to America, but Americans went to Asia. Asians, it must be remembered, did not come to take the wealth of America. Americans went to take the wealth of Asia, end quote. It's a pretty simplistic, simplified narrative, but it does upend the ways that we traditionally think about Asian immigration to the United States. And it was within this colonial world that Asians traveled across the Pacific as migrant workers, their journeys fundamentally linked to America's manifest destiny in North America. So the Chinese were the first sizable, uh, sizable group of Asians to arrive in the United States. They came in the 1850s, a majority of them from Guangdong province which had been devastated by a series of natural disasters and the economic effects of the Treaty of Nanking. When they arrived, they faced a barrage of laws that restricted their social and economic mobility and that reinforced their exclusion from Republican society. In 1850, the foreign miners tax was levied on miners ineligible for citizenship, which at that time targeted the Chinese. Okay, owing to the 1790 naturalization law that limited citizenship rights to quote-unquote free white persons. In 1854, the California Supreme Court case, or the California Supreme Court in the case People v. Hall, determined that a Chinese person could not testify against white citizens. The ruling upheld an existing California statute that stated, quote, no blacks or mulatto person or Indian shall be allowed to give evidence in favor of or against the white man. Now, without having specified the Chinese um, in the original statute, the Supreme Court went on to argue that in fact the term Indian um, denoted anyone of the mongoloid race okay, because Native Americans had once crossed the Bering Strait over from Asia. 
If that was not convincing enough, they also argued that the term black should be understood in its generic sense to mean anyone not white. <laughs> so in this way, the Chinese has a new racial presence and a new racial problem in California became incorporated into the system of white supremacy that preserved the benefits of citizenship to free white men. These discriminatory and indeed, I would argue, race-making legislations in the, in the ways that they created a new category of the Chinese race, right, all contributed to the marginalization of the Chinese in American society, and they also further ensured that those who came would be valued only for their labor and not for their lives. And in fact, it was precisely because of their precarious status as migrant workers with no recourse to civil rights that employers like Charles Crocker of the Central Pacific were so drawn to the Chinese in the first place as a workforce. The Chinese made up something like 90% of the workforce on the Central Pacific. Um, and to people like Crocker, the Chinese were seen as cheap labor. Right? They were seen as docile. They wouldn't strike. They never speak up. Right? That was, those were the rationales for employing these Chinese in such large numbers. It was also exactly for this reason that white immigrant workers had a particular hatred for the Chinese. Okay, so throughout the 1860s and 1870s, we see these kinds of political cartoons representing the interests of the white working class emerge. Okay, so here's an image juxtaposing Chinese immigrants um, compared to the white family, right? So the reason why the Chinese can live on 40 cents a day and they can't is because they like to congregate in very close quarters. They don't have homes and families. Apparently they eat rats, right? So these are the kinds of images that were proliferating during this period. Here's another image. This one's kind of hilarious. It's how the opium habit is developed and you can see the ways in which representations of the Chinese and Chinatown is seen as a sexual threat to working class white women, right? So white women who venture into Chinatown, they can easily get duped um, into Chinatown opium dens. Okay? So they were seen as a, both as an economic and as a sexual threat. So indeed, these racialized perceptions of the Chinese as foreign, as a threat to white women and to the white working class did not stop them from being employed by the Central Pacific. <coughs> Company executives would work them extra hard, giving them very little time to rest, making sure that they would meet their quotas of however many miles of tracks they needed to lay down per day. Okay, so here's some images of um, of Chinese workers working at the railroad by the Central Pacific photographer Alfred Hart, okay, who really documented some of um, the nitty gritty of what the work entailed in constructing the railroads. Okay? And it was also through his photographs that we can see representations of the Chinese. Um, so if the Chinese were deemed, oh, here's one more image I wanted to show. Um, so on one of these days, right, so Charles Crocker wanted to set quotas for them to meet uh, every day, like six or seven miles of tracks to be laid. On one of these days, the Chinese actually laid 10 miles of track, okay, which Charles, which won Charles Crocker $10,000 in bet from his competitor, as well as his boasting rights of the sign, which I think you can see outside as well. So if the Chinese were deemed an economic threat by white workers, people like Charles Crocker showered them with praises. Okay? As one of the executives said, quote, they learn quickly, they don't fight, they don't strike, and they're very cleanly in their habits. They will gamble and do argue among themselves most noisily, but they do so harmlessly, end quote. Okay? And another had this to say, I wish to call to your minds that the early com completion of this railroad we have built has been in large measure due to that poor, despised class of laborers called the Chinese, to the fidelity and industry they have shown." End quote. So were the Chinese really the good workers that these companies had hoped? Right? They certainly placed their bet on it. Right? They would employ them by the thousands. 
But there is at least one historical account where the Chinese actually walked off their jobs. It happened in the early summer of 1867 at Donner Pass in the northern Sierra Nevada. Even though it was far from the winter season that summer, it was already covered in 10 to 12 feet of snow. And as long as the snow kept piling up, it had to be shoveled, which delayed the building of the railroads considerably. <laughs> Some of the workers began deserting their job. They began looking for work in nearby mining towns. They wanted to go elsewhere. In response, Charles Crocker raised the workers' wages to $4, or by $4, to $35 a month. Okay, so he was raising their wages, hoping that that would be enough to keep them and also to attract more workers to come. Instead of getting more workers, it seemed to have the opposite effect. Okay. On June 25th, Chinese workers left their work along a two-mile stretch of the Sierra Slope and went back to their camp. The workers demanded $40 a month. In addition, they also asked for a reduction in hours to no more than 10 hours a day and they asked for shorter shifts during the most dangerous parts of the job. Okay. For example, in the cramped tunnels, which were really quite dangerous. Charles Crocker was not intimidated. Okay. He told the leaders of the Chinese strikers that he would rather stop all construction before he considered even one of their demands. Okay. So what did the Chinese workers do? More of them walked off their job and now they raised their wage demands to $45 a month. Okay, so they were saying, this guy's not getting it, right? We demand an increase in wages, right? So you can imagine Crocker's confusion, right? When did the Chinese become all demanding and more all militant, right? This is not the image of the Chinese that, they, that he had in mind. At first, he thought that some Chinese opium dealers were behind it, and then he suspected their rival Union Pacific for instigating the strike. What he never considered was that his workers had real legitimate grievances. <coughs> so instead of meeting their, their demands, he responded by cutting off their supplies. He stopped agents from delivering food and provisions to the mountains. And for one week, the Chinese had no fresh supply of food coming into their camps. After one week, Crocker went back to the work camps. He gave them an ultimatum. He said, he wasn't going to budge on the wages and hours. Either you return to work and get penalized a small fine, or if they continued with the strike, they wouldn't get paid for the entire month. So by then, facing malnutrition, most men eventually went back to work. They didn't get their wage increase. They didn't get their hours decreased. <coughs> So in my introduction to Asian American history course, okay, I use this example um, to my students. I pose this example to my students and I ask them whether they think this, res this act of resistance can be deemed successful or not, right? And the point that I want to make is that, indeed, at face value, it would seem that they were unsuccessful. They didn't get what they demanded. They were forced back to go to work. But these failures should not detract us from recognizing the broader significance of their resistance. That is their refusal to submit to the dehumanized conditions of migrant labor and to insist that they were not disposable, that they were workers entitled to a livable wage, to safe work conditions, and to dignity. And so indeed at the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad, not only was the presence of the Chinese erased, but so too were these important acts of resistance. And I would argue that ultimately this is what's at stake in recounting the history of the Chinese and the railroads and also of doing Asian American history more broadly. That is the point isn't simply to recover their presence of these excluded or marginalized peoples and write them back into a more inclusive narrative of American history Rather, it is to recognize their multifaceted struggles against oppression whenever and wherever they occurred and the, crea and the creative means by which Asians carved out a meaningful existence within a nation that only saw them as a temporary solution or a problem. And here I'm thinking about not only these overt acts of resistance, such as labor strikes, of which there were many, but also of less overt forms of resistance rooted in the forging of community, 
of fictive kinship in the face of exclusion laws, the practice of what historian Nayan Shah calls stranger intimacy that gave meaning and purpose to the lives of migrants. It is through these acts of community, community and resistance that capture the spirit of an ongoing struggle for justice not yet fully achieved. Thank you. Okay. So now it is my pleasure to introduce our guests. Okay. I'll introduce Mary Lee first. Mary Lee is the curator of the Chinese Ameri of Chinese American history at San Diego Chinese Historical Museum. He has made presentations at various local schools and colleges and at various organizations and national conferences. He received his BA and MA in geography at George Washington University, where he was elected to Phi Beta Kappa. He has extensive professional experience in the supervision of geographic and cart cartographic research and graphics design in the production of maps, atlases, publications, and uh, visual presentations and exhibits. He's a World War II veteran, having served in the merchant, US Merchant Marines. In 2012, he published a book titled In Search of Gold Mountain, a history of the Chinese in San Diego, California. And currently, he's close to publishing a book titled Elephant and the Indians, My Grandfather, the elephant, a Chinese railroad worker, is captured by Indians. Hilton Openzinger is the associate director of the Chinese Railroad Workers Project and also a lecturer in American Studies and English at Stanford University. He's the author of American Palestine, Melville, Twain, and the Holy Land Mania, which is a literary and historical study of America's fascination with the Holy Land. He has published numerous chapters in books and articles, in scholarly journals, and he's currently writing a new book titled Melting Pots and Promised Lands, Early Zionism and the Idea of America, which is a study of entwined settler colonial narratives from the 19th century to 1948. He has most recently published an autobiographical novel called Busy Dying, and his other books include Cannibal Elliot and the Lost Histories of San Francisco, New York on Fire, and This Passover or the Next I Will Never Be in Jerusalem, which received the American Book Award. Mm -hmm. So with that, I will turn it over to, who's the next speaker? Mr. Lee. Mr. Lee, please. <laughs> Can I comment on some of his and not take out of how long That uh, photograph you had of the uh, uh, driving of the golden spike, you know, they took a, supposedly took a picture. There's no photo of driving the spike because the, cam because the camera screwed up on that. Uh, and so there's no photo of that. And in regard to the Chinese being not being there, in um, Sacramento's uh, Railroad Museum, if you go in there, you'll see a painting done where they paint in Chinese to make it sort of make up for you know the lack of them being there. Anyway, uh, and one of the reasons the Chinese were actually healthier is because they didn't drink the water through the desert and all that. They had these. Uh, uh, boys had brought big barrels, whiskey barrels full of water out to the, for them to drink. And another thing that they did, which the other workers thought they were crazy, is they always took a bath in this hot water uh, right after they, because uh, they worked from sunrise to sunset. And they laughed at him and said, oh, you're just going to get dirty again. You know, why are you doing this? And uh, they didn't realize this is a way that they relaxed after, you know, a 12 hour day of working. So that's some adding to your <laughs> uh, trans. All right, the, uh, this is also a transcontinental railroad. 
Uh, it uh, goes through the Pacific Northwest. Uh, my grandfather worked uh, from, say, Seattle towards, uh, well, I guess they went all the way to Lake Superior. And, uh, and um, let's see, where is the, this is the, There we go. Uh, this is the title, uh, Elephant and the Indians, a grandfather. My grandfather, the elephant, a Chinese railroad worker, is captured by Indians. And uh, I wrote this book, actually, with a text in 2002. And I was sort of sitting on it because I said, something like this needs to be illustrated. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have anybody to illustrate until I met Mona Mills who's sitting right here, the artist. And uh, when I saw her paintings and that, I said, well, she's the one that needs to illustrate this. So she's been doing it. And we have about 16 little paintings over there you can see that go to illustrate this book. Uh, I want to mention that Murray was chosen as a San Diego County legend. And oh, that's yeah. how I met you. <laughs> well, that's right, the San Diego. Yeah, I'm a living legend. A living which, legend. Yes. <laughs> which is better than that's the alternative. Be alive for <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Okay. Uh, we threw in a few uh, small little illustrations into this because uh, somebody said, oh, you can't have a book like this with text in there without something on these pages. So we started out with my grandfather cutting a tree down with his ax. <laughs> and uh, uh, <clears throat> then he was captured while they were working. Uh, they were working clearing the land for the building of the railroad. And of course, it's up in probably up somewhere around Idaho and that. And uh, there was a lot of trees in that. Area. And he was uh, working over away from the rest of the group. And when these uh, the Indians uh, attacked there, uh, he was isolated in that, and they they jumped him. And he was uh, he was over six foot tall, and known by, as the elephant by his fellow workers. So uh, he threw them off, and, <laughs> but uh, they all they all started to jump him and they captured him and threw him over a horse and hauled him off to their, well, somebody said, oh, we have to save this guy. He's such a good fighter and that our chief will want us to see him. So anyway, he went off to, uh, to the village. What does Tall Elk doing in here? <laughs> oh. Anyway. Oh, we don't need to talk to us. We got to go back to uh, where are these? Let's go back to the cover here. Okay, this is uh, this is in the village where he uh, he ends up, uh, and they all sort of look at him and say, "Wow, who is who is this guy? He doesn't look like the normal railroad workers." The, the whites that the, they encountered before because they were trying to, you know, uh, chase all the workers away because the, uh, uh, we had infringed on their, on their uh, areas that we had given them some time before, but when, whenever we found gold or whenever we <clears throat> wanted to build a railroad, they would just forget about these treaties and start to build them. So anyway, uh, here is he trying to, he's talking to the chief and trying to say, describe who he is. And um, he's, he says that he well, was called the elephant and uh, the chief didn't know what that was. He thought it was a buffalo maybe because they didn't know what an elephant was. And the chief was a white eagle. And the chief uh, described his, his name by pointing at a, you know, at a bird on the, on the teepee, and uh, my <clears throat> grandfather was drawing an elephant in the ground there and pointing over to a tree, saying that the elephant had legs like the trunk of a tree. So 
That's how we got the name. Now, let me see what, what's wrong with this. <laughs> Which way are we going to go here? Oh. Okay, then the, uh, while in the uh, uh, Indians camp, uh, the chief invited him to, to a meal with them. And here he's, uh, they're eating, uh, well, buffalo meat, because that was one of the things that they died in. And uh, one of the things he particularly liked was that uh, my grandfather liked was buffalo tongue, because that was a lot like stuff they'd eaten in China. And <coughs> the man over there on the left is the medicine man, and he is very leery about my grandfather. Who is this guy? Does he come here to take my job? You know, <laughs> and that, and uh, uh, so anyway, uh, they're eating, and uh, you can see the, their horses in the background and their teepees. Now we gotta make sure this is going the right way. Okay, there's the buffalo. Okay, the first thing that they do is uh, they decided that they're on the plateau area and, and they could go down into the plains where the buffalo were, that is where some of the buffalo were still left because, you know, we were, we were killing the buffalo off as fast as we could from, from the trains and everything else. And there were a lot, many of the, many of the buffalo were, were in, in trouble. And here they were going and they have this travois, which they carry their teepees and everything because it's several days travel. All the families go and they're heading for uh, the buffalo country. And I got an Appaloosa horse in there. That's one of the fillers because that's what they rode. And as they got towards the uh, plains area, uh, they sighted buffalo. And uh, as you know, when a buffalo stampede, there's a huge roar and a dust coming up in the air and, and they have to chase them along and, uh -oh. And my grandfather combines with, with this Indian tall elk uh, because the, the way they kill the buffalo is, is um, uh, one Indian would, would shoot him with a bow and then another Indian would ride up on the other side with a lance and spear him in the heart. And so they did that and uh, they successively uh, killed his buffalo and um, the Indian yelled out a, a large whoop and uh, my grandfather followed that too <laughs> with an equally large yell of his own. And uh, his fellow Indian name was called Tall Elk and I think you did see a picture of it before. And so uh, the Indians just usually only killed what they could carry back with them. And they set up a camp to process all the meat and that, and, and in the hides. And uh, uh, so when they got back um, to the village, uh, they had a big party because of, because of buffalo. They got a lot of buffalo, and they they danced all night out and. Uh, uh, in the in the village, and uh, was celebrating. Then, uh, oops, they decided that uh, they wanted to go the other direction, where they could uh, go to the say the Columbia River, the Snake River, and others to. Uh, to trade with some tribes, friendly tribes, that uh, would gather fish and dry them and that. And so this is their uh, ride to uh, 
uh, going from their villages to, a, to another village. And along the way, um, uh, a young Indian girl attaches herself to grandfather and she was explaining to them in Indian what all the sites were like, you know, the bird there and uh, what the flowers and plants were in the trees. And he was repeating after her, you know, to try to remember all the, all the terms. And, and uh, so she was a, a very striking young lady with black hair and braids framing her face. And she wore a hat that was finely woven of straw and, and buckskin blouse with fringes and lightweight leggings. And as it grew cooler in the evening, she would, she would uh, add a shawl. And she, we went by, she went by a river and uh, she pointed to that and that's, that's one of the uh, kind of rivers uh, with the uh, uh, stream flowing fast and that's why she got the name Dancing Waters. And she loved to describe the land and when they got to the the other Indians uh, camp, uh, you see uh, salmon hanging there drying on the racks there. Uh, these Indians did a lot of fishing and uh, they had, they did not have these horses and they did not have buffalo hides. So that's one of the trading goods that uh, uh, they would, would use to get the salmon and, uh, and all the other dried things from, the, from this camp. So then they continued down in the river areas, down to an area near, uh, uh, near the Columbia River, Walla Walla in that area. And um, uh, they, where they had these trading marketplaces where a lot of tribes would gather and uh, would have a rendezvous and trade with each other. And they usually had a, 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 a place where a marketplace where they would buy goods. There was a Chinese that had this uh, uh, market there, uh, and uh, he was from the same area as uh, as grandfather was, and so they were able to converse. In fact, my grandfather uh, told him if he would give a letter or take a letter and mail it back in China when he went back in China uh, because uh, his family didn't know where he was and, and to let him know that he was all right. And, and in exchange for doing that, uh, grandfather gave him one of his buffalo hides. So the main purpose of going to this particular market was to buy rifles guns because the, uh, the U.S. Army wanted to, to have all these, uh, all the Indians go to a re reservation and uh, they didn't like this idea because they wanted to be, live in the area where they've always lived and be buried where all their other ancestors built, very similar to what the Chinese, you know, did. So, uh, so they, they bought these rifles because they knew they had to, uh, uh, going to have a fight because they're going to uh, did not want to go to uh, reservations and most of them would go to Oklahoma. On the way back um, to feed themselves they saw these deer and I stuck this deer in there. They shot a deer. <laughs> We've got to do something about his horns getting that Indian out of the horns. Yeah. Right. Rose. <laughs> anyway. So when they got back, uh, Dancing Waters and Lee, they had a teepee of their own, and here they were talking. She was telling the story about uh, how she has lived in a tribe uh, with her parents, and um, the parents, they were noted for breeding horses, and that's the Appaloosa horses. And while their men were away on a hunting trip, a hostile band of Indians, because some of the Indians did fight each other, 
uh, raided their village and stole many of their horses. Her parents were killed in trying to defend the herd. And then Chief White Eagle brought her to live with his tribe and continued her work. And she continued her work with the horses. And then he was telling about his life back in the village in China um, where uh, they worked in the fields and they had these buffaloes, but the buffaloes were smooth skinned. They weren't the kind of buffaloes that they had in the West there. They were water buffaloes and they used them the same way in, in working uh, the fields and the plowing and stuff. So what happened was uh, the tribes got together uh, with one of the senior chiefs, chief, who I call Running Horse, I have to make these names up so it sounded good, and he, he, he met with all the other elders of the tribe and saying that we've got to leave because uh, uh, the army is going to, to take over our land and send us all to, to reservations say, down in Oklahoma or someplace. And so he said the only alternative was to go across the border into Canada and avoid a fight with the, with the whites. Now, they did do that. And um, this is uh, a picture of them going up the mountains towards the, to the north. And uh, the chief told uh, my grandfather that, oh, uh, this was not his fight. You should go home to your family because they, because you know we took, we captured you and took your livelihood away, and uh, you should you should go on back. And and so this is where he is saying goodbye to, to Dancing Waters. Does this have a point about it? Murray. Yeah. Did he stay with the tribe for two years? Didn't he? Two years. Yes, two years. Yeah. This Very is the end of two years. So. He never wanted to escape because he didn't know where to go and he was being treated very well because he was adopted by the chief anyway. And when you're adopted by the chief, you have a lot of privileges that you might not have otherwise. Two years so, means that uh, he may have so he's, the family. He's, he's, <laughs> waving, he's waving goodbye and he's going towards where the railroad was. Uh, uh, and uh, as he went, he, he was really sad and he didn't know what to do, so he started. He started shouting out, and, and as, as loud as he could, all the names of things he could remember that Dancing Waters had told him about the mountains and that, and, and just to keep himself sane, I guess. And um, Dancing Waters, he was wondering because she was pregnant at the time, so he was. He was very worried about well, what was going to happen to, you know, their child. So he he comes to this saloon, which is on the uh, near the the railroad, because at that time the the railroad had a town built there, and and uh, he runs into this uh, Chinese gambler, and um, of course he has ch changed into his. Uh, uh, his early, his older clothes, rather than to walk in, you know, dressed as a, as an Indian, and uh, the gambler said he'd like to hire him, uh, and he would pay for his way to to Baltimore, Maryland, where my grandfather wanted to go because he had a brother there, and uh, so grandfather said, well, I've got to sell my horse which he felt very sad about because the horse was given to him by the chief and that's the only animal he'd ever owned. And so they boarded the train here, um, heading for Baltimore, and this is the Northern Pacific. And so the gambler needed my grandfather as a bodyguard because he probably, uh, when he won money, it was be all in cash. <laughs> and so he would be subject to being, being attacked. 
And so I put this in as a thing. Was, There's no higher hand than this. And, and so that's the gambler's winning hand, that ace high straight. And this is the, uh, this, this is the picture of, of the uh, montage of all of those individual images that uh, Mona painted, you know, and we don't have it over there, but, but uh, that's the end. Thank you. Now, could you tell him about what happened after your grandfather arrived in Baltimore and how he met his aunt, which is very interesting, and he bought farm and... Uh, well, he, yeah, he actually, yeah, that's sort of beyond, a little bit beyond the story. They do, he does arrive in Baltimore, and <clears throat> there is a relative that mentioned that he did come to Baltimore uh, with a gambler, and they didn't know why. Why was he with this gambler? Well, I explained it as he was the bodyguard for this gambler. <laughs> because he had all this money and, uh, and, and, and uh, my grandfather was big and strong and so nobody would, would mess with him. So uh, in Baltimore then, he, he went down, he, there was Chinatown in Baltimore where his brother had a, had a, had a business and he went down to, uh, uh, towards uh, a river area, Patuxent, I think, river, one of those rivers in, in, um, and, and, and had a farm. So, so he raised uh, uh, vegetables and stuff for, for the business. And he had horses there. And he died, actually, chasing a runaway horse where a truck hit him. So it probably wasn't an Appaloosa horse, or he, he wouldn't have gotten it. So anyway, that's, that's, what, that's what happened. Then. He, went back to, he went back to China to marry, get married and uh, brought, uh, brought his wife back. And it took him seven months on a Chinese junk to get believe it or not, to get to, a, to America. I heard that story before. Sandra Lee? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She told me that story. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> yeah, with the Indians. Yeah, yeah, right. Oh, that's great. Okay, I'll just start off with that one. Okay. Well, thank you very much. This is terrific. And uh, I, I want to just briefly go through some of the things about um, the exhibition and, and the, um, the project that we do. Um, uh, I'd like to thank everyone who organized this uh, event. And I'd like to thank uh, uh, people in the Chinese Historical Society, especially Amy Lam, who was the designer. Uh, who did the design work. Uh, this is actually something like a fourth of the uh, entire exhibition. It's quite large, uh, uh, but you know this all makes sense. Um, this was all done for an event that uh, we co-sponsored, the project and the uh, Historical Society, the Chinese and the Iron Road, at Stanford University on uh, June 6th uh, this past year. Uh, to commemorate the 150th anniversary of large numbers of Chinese coming to work on the railroad. Now, um, Chinese worked on the railroad before. Uh, uh, Chinese, uh, I call California Chinese, people who were here from the gold rush, uh, and, um, but they ran out of uh, labor. Um, they uh, recruited in the various Chinatowns in the Sierras and uh, Sacramento, et cetera. Uh, so that's when they uh, sent uh, labor contractors out to Guangdong to uh, arrange for uh, other workers to come. Um, so it's the 150th anniversary, and um, our project said we need to do something to commemorate this, but we're not a community project, we're not an uh, organizing group. 
and uh, the you know so we collaborated with the historical society, and um, it was a wonderful event with this exhibition with many uh, descendants of railroad workers, and also to kind of underscore uh, the dean of uh, uh, humanities and sciences. Uh, spoke and for the first time Stanford University acknowledged that the university would not exist without the Chinese railroad workers because the wealth that they produced made Leland Stanford enormously wealthy and what the circumstances of his life, his son dying, etc., giving the money over to create the university. Um, as well, the um, um, the council general from the uh, uh, Chinese uh, uh, Councilor uh, spoke and also acknowledged the contribution of the Chinese railroad workers, which as far as we know from the Qing Dynasty on is the first time the Chinese government acknowledged the contribution uh, of the Chinese railroad workers. So uh, this kind of marks the fact that there's a lot of things happening to kind of catch up uh, um, in terms of this history. Can I get out of this here? Now, how do I get to the uh, the slideshow? Click on that. Damn technology. <laughs> okay, here we are back at that picture, um, and uh, you know the, the reality is is uh, uh, so much has been done. We only get a mention of the Chinese, as was pointed out in the uh, high school textbooks, um, and uh, it's a uh, um, uh, an emptiness, as you know, a kind of absence. Um, so where are the Chinese? Um, just click it. Yeah, okay, here we go. Uh, here's a close-up. We don't see any Chinese in this picture uh, of the celebration of this link, uh, as it was pointed out, you know, for the development of the U.S., the development of empire. Keep in mind the Suez Canal was opening up at the same time. And this is, when we talk about globalization, this is it happening. There were Chinese there. Here's a, a, a photo by Russell, uh, Alfred L Russell. And uh, if you, there you go. Uh, we identify these uh, people, the arrows are pointing out, as Chinese who were laying uh, the rails down. Um, so we're back at this photo. Uh, but if you look closely at the photo, and uh, Gordon Chang, our co-director, and I, I should say, you know, greetings from Gordon Chang and Professor Shelley Fisher Fishkin, who are the co-directors of our project, uh, and he brought this up. Of you look at this uh, closely, um, there's a man wearing workers' clothes. There aren't too many people who are actually dressed as workers here. They're, they're a little bit more, or they're dressed up. Um, and the man standing next to him um, is holding a hat in front of his face. Now, um, to take a photo at that time, you couldn't just say, click, you know, you had to actually stand there for a while. So holding the hat was a deliberate act to cover his face so that he really had a presence that was absent. <laughs> uh, there's another person on the other side of the picture that uh, whose whose back is turned, and seems to be wearing also uh, more uh, worker clothes. So, uh, in other words, uh, we really have to extract what's going on. We have to look closely at all of the material and find out what's going on, because um, it, it's uh, very uh, difficult, and this is the uh, the web uh, homepage uh, for our project, and urge you to go to it, and and to check out different aspects. What's what's new? You can go through and and, and, and get a, a sense of the history of the project, uh, research resources, etc., uh, by looking at this. Uh, but what we're trying to do is to get material information about. Um, the railroad workers, when nothing written by them exists. 
So it's trying to create the voice of people who don't have the usual material from histor that historians use. Uh, so it's by inference. It's by finding and locating things that we did not know existed before, uh, and as well as hearing stories of uh, oral, uh, oral history and trying to work with that. Now, for, I'll give you an example. We talked about the strike. Uh, very important uh, moment. Um, one of the things they stroke, uh, the strike was about was that they would not be beaten, whipped when they wanted to quit. That uh, they had the right to leave work and go get some better job somewhere else. Uh, and there was such a scarcity of labor that the managers on the road uh, you know, would force them to go back to work, go back to work. And uh, we're trying to find out more uh, what's involved in that. Uh, the big four, the people involved in the railroad, were being constantly criticized as um, uh, having slaves. And they were Abraham Lincoln Republicans, abolitionists. And so they had to prove that they weren't slaves. So this is a constant uh, tension uh, going on about, um, well, they're not forced, you have to pay them. Uh, now, but we don't have any, any material. We just discovered, and I, I can't tell you about it because I haven't read it, uh, one of our collaborators, a professor in Quebec, has found a travel book by a French traveler who was at the strike. So we might actually find out something about that, but it's taken this kind of search and serendipity in order to find it. Um, so uh, we, we're trying to find out who these people are. We want to find out their names, um, uh, where they're from, the whole his as much as we can, because we estimate 10 to 12,000 people worked uh, on the job. So uh, one of the things that we're doing is uh, building a digital archive. Uh, of all materials so that everyone, scholars and the public, can go and explore the different aspects of this. Um, now, this is a mock-up of what the home page of a digital archive might look, uh, look like. We were very naive when we started out on this. We thought it wouldn't be any big deal. It's a big deal. Uh, uh, you know, all of the permissions, all of, you know, the, uh, uh, the metadata, finding things and et cetera uh, is an enormous task and we hope to have it and we plan to have it up in time for the 2019 uh, 150th anniversary of the Golden Spike. So this is one aspect of our, uh, uh, of our project. Uh, we're working with um, SESTA, the Center for Spatial and Textual Analysis uh, at Stanford. Who sp they specialize in doing these kinds of digital projects, uh, digital humanities. Um, and so uh, we have uh, you know, collaborators who know and have taught us <laughs> something about what we need to do. And part of what they can do uh, is uh, digital visualizations, that we could be able to travel along the railroad and to find out what the experience was like and, and facts of happening. So this is a contour map uh, that they developed of uh, the tunnels uh, in the Sierras that they uh, worked through. Just one kind of representation. And so what we do is that we um, develop relations with uh, scholars from all around the world. Um, and uh, we uh, made a request in um, uh, spring of 2012 uh, to the president of Stanford University saying, this is the project, this is very important, and it's very important for Stanford. Uh, fortunately, he got it right away. Yeah, this is very important. We need to acknowledge this. Um, and gave us seed money, and we were able to get grants and other monies once we started going. Well, one of the first things we did was to organize a conference of scholars uh, from the US, China, uh, Taiwan, Hong Kong, uh, Canada, uh, to begin talking about you know, okay, this person studies food, uh, and what's the food distribution system that they use? Here's a, you know, uh, another. Um, we also develop relations with universities in China as well as in Taiwan. 
um, and this is a meeting we had uh, with the uh, representatives of the Guangdong Overseas Chinese History Program, um, which was a, a government and university project to recover the history, because people from Guangdong went all over. They went to Mexico, they went to Peru, they went to Cuba, N New Zealand, etc. And so they are trying to gather this kind of history. Um, so we've made uh, many of these agreements. Then in uh, 2013, we had another workshop, uh, this time in Taipei, um, you know, uh, extending uh, all of the materials that we've been developing. Uh, and then we also had a an archaeology workshop, historical archaeologists who have done work along uh, the railroad work places, okay, and uh, for the first time brought archaeologists together. They work separately, they usually don't have a connection. Here we got a railroad in this linear kind of fashion, but they're just digging over here, and this one's digging over there. Um, they're academic, they're government, like national parks. Uh, and they're private companies because when someone wants to dig up something, we want to make sure that we don't disturb any graves or anything like that. So they're called in. So uh, we have a large number of archaeologists who are, uh, uh, you know, trying to uh, you know, expand our base of knowledge. I hit the wrong button. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So. Uh, <laughs> In the fall of 2015, we had another workshop in Guangzhou in, uh, at uh, Sun Yat-sen University. Um, and uh, we traveled, the picture on the top is from the Museum of Overseas Chinese, of railroad workers. They're actually working in Canada. But in any case, um, by their dress, et cetera, there are differences. Um, but one of the things that we've learned is that the Central Pacific is not the only railroad. We keep on learning of more and more railroads where Chinese worked. In fact, we just found out that Chinese worked on the Long Island Railroad uh, in New York, 1875. So, you know, the, in Texas, uh, you know, Oregon, the Northern Pacific, Southern Pacific, all of these different uh, railroads, it's, it's really quite remarkable. So we're having this meeting, and then this lower corner here is uh, 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 Celia Tan, who uh, is a professor at Wu Yi University, uh, who specializes in understanding the villages where uh, the people came from, and develop you know historical site of the uh, of the famous um, houses that have been built there. Uh, kneeling down is Barbara Voss, professor of anthropology, who's the head of the archaeology network, and there was a um, delegation of, of people who went to uh, village to do further research uh, uh, earlier, uh, or, you know, in the, fo the, uh, the fall this year. Uh, they, um, you know, interestingly, they did not call themselves archaeologists because from the Chinese point of view, if you say you're an archaeologist, you want to dig up national treasures and steal them. Uh, they're not interested in finding pottery, old pieces of pottery, and the kinds of things they're looking for. So they're folklorists uh, 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 for these purposes. OK, well, this is one of the villages uh, that we were uh, able to visit. OK, so. Um, this is, you know, the kind of uh, uh, work that we do. So the question is, how do we reveal the history, the reality, the experience, the beliefs, um, when there are no, you know, there are no documents from them? Uh, there are the reports uh, that Charles Crocker and Leland Stanford wrote, uh, letters to Abraham Lincoln, uh, to the Congress, uh, letters between the Big Four you know, uh, articles and books uh, uh, by people who would, but they're all not Chinese looking at Chinese. Uh, and so we have to constantly interpret, uh, just as, you know, you were interpreting, uh, you know, uh, did they really like the Chinese or they just like the fact that they were cheap? Um, you know, how do we assess this um, type, uh, type of situation? So. 
So we're trying to pull together as many things as we can. Uh, payroll sheets from the Central Pacific indicating payments to Chinese workers. There are a limited number of these payroll sheets. They didn't keep complete, uh, you know, keep the entire thing. As, as you might know, in the Union Pacific and Central Pacific, after the railroad was completed, uh, there was big scandals, uh, Credit Mobilier scandal, uh, that they were basically skimming off or ripping off. It was a, it was a government private collaboration, and uh, private did quite well. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, you know, and the government gave public lands along the railroad. Whose lands were those public lands? Those tribes uh, who were decimated, um, uh, the Plains Indians, in, in terms of doing uh, this project. On top of that, the names in the payroll are not Chinese names, or they're, you know, it's Ah Feng, Ah Chung, or John Chinaman. Um, and then in some instances, it's pay given to a, uh, a headman who then divides it up to, to give to other people. So we can't get even an accurate sense of how many people worked at any one time. I'm doing that research now, and it's maddening because there are so many contradictory things going on. Okay, we can look at those reports. Here's the chief engineer, and we find out different things like that. For example, the, the ferocious winters that they worked in uh, in the Sierra Mountains and how they survived or didn't because of avalanches. Um, census data. Uh, here's census from a, a county in Utah, uh, uh, you know, where they say and they try and determine what their trade is uh, in uh, 1870. Uh, or the documents later, uh, you know, having to travel, wanting to go to China and then come back, and because of the Exclusion Act and all this stuff of making sure that you had a story, not just the paper sons, but other kinds of stories to tell, and from that to be able to try and extrapolate uh, what that experience was, and all kinds of ephemera, travelogues, books. Uh, many, it was a you know, big sensation. Many travelers and journalists went and wrote up uh, their accounts, but they also need to be interpreted. Uh, so the new data is uh, uh, material that the archaeologists are finding that you know, kind of reveal aspects of, of their life. For example, one archaeologist works on animal bones and uh, determined from sites where the camps were that they had a very you know, expanded diet of meat, um, good for working such hard work in the mountains, but also hunting for meat probably was uh, you know, more available. Uh, so uh, learning those kinds of things. And the other thing that we're trying to do is oral history. Um, uh, uh, families of descendants of railroad workers, what do they know about their ancestor, um, such as what we just heard, okay? Um, and it's very hard. Historians don't take uh, oral testimony that seriously because it's like, well, memory, things, you know, people are honest, but do they really know? Uh, uh, however, we, we want to trust people because at the very least, this is what their families know. And what we want to find out is the trajectory of their families, right? What did they do? How did they survive? And generations, uh, and generations with that memory. Uh, of their ancestor. Now we're trying to get oral histories in China, and we have some collaborators in China doing that. However, uh, the meaning of being an ancestor of a railroad worker in China and in the U.S. is different. In the U.S., there's a certain amount of pride at this stage, which is, you know, we help to build America. You know, we're pioneers, we're heroes, uh, so to speak. Uh, it's much more complicated than that, but still, they feel good about it, and they should. Um, in China, it was kind of like, well, he went to work and he came back. What's the big deal? Um, and also, uh, with uh, uh, in the early days, the Qing dynasty did not like people leaving. It was illegal at one point, uh, and you know it was really not on the radar. And then certainly after 1949, and especially in the Cultural Revolution, you don't want any documents, you don't want any memory associated with the U.S. Um, 
So we're still working on that, uh, but we're having a far easier time. We're working with Barry Fong and Connie Young Yu of the Chinese Historical Society. Barry Fong is a filmmaker, doing interviews of, of uh, the different uh, families. Uh, here's uh, kind of a more extended one. Raymond Chang, the great-great-grandson of a uh, railroad worker, and knows the village, connected to the village, worked with Celia Jinwatan about you know, what goes on in those village, um, and, and drew out all the kinds of connections, the design of the village, et cetera. Uh, if we know what village life was like you know, in its you know, uh, full dimensions, we'll get a sense of what happened when those people came. Um, now, uh, the the um, fact of the matter is we still have to extrapolate, and I'll give you another example. Many went to Cuba to work. In Cuba, they were indentured servants. Uh, they were virtually slaves. And in the Overseas Chinese Museum we went to, there was a picture, big photo, of a uh, Chinese worker in sugarcane fields in chains because he had tried to run away, okay? Very different from the California. They might have been beaten. You, 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 we don't want you to quit, but they were not slaves. Um, and the Qing dynasty was so disturbed by the reports that they got that they sent an investigative unit, okay, uh, to and really took detailed information about all the people who were in Cuba working, uh, and then also then after they said, okay, we're not sending people to Cuba anymore. Um, uh, this is not right. Um, Okay, uh, Evelyn Hood Hart, who is in uh, uh, Brown University, who specializes in Chinese and Latin America, uh, did this research. There are these documents, and what's interesting about these documents, this is the same sample, so to speak, the same group of people who went to California also went to Cuba. They're all from Guangdong. They're, you know, they're all the same circumstances that they're facing. It's always assumed that you know, the vast majority of the people who went were farmers poor farmers. Well, what she determined was that 17% of those uh, people in Cuba were farmers, but the rest weren't. They were blacksmiths, carpenters, school teachers, a whole wide variety. So we have a whole different sense of, of who the people are if we extrapolate. You've got to be very cautious about doing that, but still, um, there's something there. They were honored to a certain degree. Some people debate this, you know. At the end, at that ceremony, um, Strobridge, who was the supervisor of construction, uh, invited over to have a celebration uh, from their camp at Victory. Uh, and when they entered, uh, you know, everybody cheered them, uh, etc. A tribute they well deserved, and which evidently gave them much pleasure. But it's. Um, uh, so there's this debate, oh yeah, they were recognized. Uh, well, sort of and sort of not. And when that hat is in front of someone's face, uh, there's another uh, you know, narrative behind that, which is kind of uh, white Americans are going to get pissed off. Uh, there's this debate about the Chinese uh, invading, taking over. Sound familiar? Uh, and. Uh, uh, and uh, so we better cover up his face. We're just, uh, you know, um, imagining what that could be, but these are the implications. There was the 50th anniversary, and you have the picture out there. These are three workers, and their names are on the placards, um, you know, who uh, were able to go to the 50th anniversary. So there is a certain amount of recognition, uh, but it's very limited, and especially gross in 1969. Um, when um, uh, the um, Secretary of Treasury, Volpe, spoke and did not mention the Chinese, the Chinese Historical Society had uh, uh, you know, a presentation to give, even a plaque, and he basically squeezed them out, and the thrust of his speech was, only Americans could have built this railroad. Of course, you might say the Chinese were Americans, although they weren't regarded uh, that way, and he's still not regarded. The Chinese Historical Society, uh, you know, really got enraged and protested, put the plaque there, and, you know, uh, it's beginning to happen. So the change that's coming about, 
This is Connie Young Yu, who was there in 1969 at the Department of Labor, where uh, the Chinese uh, railroad workers were inducted into the hall uh, you know, of honor. I didn't know there was one, but the Department of Labor you know, honors uh, workers, uh, and the Chinese railroad workers uh, were given that honor in uh, May uh, 2014. These are the uh, descendants of railroad workers uh, at, at the event. At the far left is uh, Secretary Perez, the Department of Labor. And uh, this is in Guangzhou, but uh, Li Zhu is on the, uh, on the right, and you'll see some of his photos are here pairing up then and now. Uh, but this is a photo of that ceremony. Uh, you can't see, he made a big panoramic photo, you can't see it very clearly, but there are a lot of Chinese there. That ceremony reenactment will never happen again uh, without there being a lot of Chinese there. Uh, it's been, uh, whatever you want to call it, possessed. Um, you know, so, you know, this was the uh, Hall of Honor induction ceremony again. And you know, this is another uh, photo. Now, I just want to end with with uh, uh, one thing. You know, or, you know, we'll try and pull together as much as possible. This is now an international, trans-Pacific effort. Uh, we still may not get a totally clear picture. Uh, we are accumulating names, histories of some individuals, uh, but we will be able to get a sense of what life was actually like not some kind of cartoon or stereotype that gets projected in high school history books and all that stuff. We eventually want to work with people in our school of education to develop K through 12 curriculum so that really the way people think in this country is going to change uh, because they will uh, imagine history in a different way. The other thing is this is not a Chinese or a Chinese American issue. This is history of this country, uh, on all the different peoples who were brought together, sometimes with sparks flying. The Irish, uh, uh, who were the mostly the white workers, although it's hard to tell, we've had to do research. Whenever they worked, the management thought that they were just white workers. But when they went on strike, or they had a fight, and they had to go on strike a lot, especially in the Union Pacific, because they wouldn't pay them. Um, uh, you know, or they got drunk, or had a fight. In, in the records, their, their notes and stuff, they say, they became Irish. <laughs> so we really don't know how many really were Irish. There were other European immigrants also there. Uh, most of them, I think, were Irish. There were Native Americans, the tribes who were murdered or their cultures uh, decimated. Uh, Mormons who helped to build uh, the railroad. Uh, a number of freed slaves worked on the Union Pacific. Uh, so uh, we're talking about a, uh, you know, a massive transformation, you know, and you know, talk about the thing around the buffalo and hunting the buffalo. They massacred the buffalo also um, uh, in, uh, in order to clear the area. Uh, so they wouldn't cross the tracks and all this sort of thing. So this is a, a very large task. And any of you who know someone or you're related to a descendant, uh, you're a descendant of a railroad worker, please contact us on our, um, you know, um, website. There's a thing of, you know, you can pull down and answer a questionnaire. And you, you'll get a visit eventually by Barry Fong or others to videotape uh, a, you know, a, a discussion with you. So anyone you know, just have them contact us. Uh, so this is something we think uh, can be done and will be done. Uh, all these things I spoke about will happen. And 2019 will be a very interesting commemoration as a result of all this. Again, we're not a community organization. People contact us, we want to put on an event. And we say, well, you put on an event and we can help with information, we can help. We have to focus in on the academic research. Um, but there are a lot of people. There's a movement now for to put a monument up in the Sierra. 
to the railroad workers, for example, linked with APAPA, the uh, uh, political Asian Pacific Island uh, political association. So, um, you know, there are a lot of things happening. And, and they're happening it's in a spontaneous way. In China, there's a, um, what do you call it, um, a cantata being written uh, about the railroad workers, you know, that they want to perform uh, at Stanford, uh, for example. So the amount of creativity, a book, you know, around, you know, it is really enormous, very uh, positive, uh, and uh, we hope that uh, uh, consciousness actually changes as a result. Thanks a lot. So um, let me ask uh, our three speakers to uh, assemble up at the front of the room. We do have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, and while you're assembling, um, let me just say that uh, w what has struck me by this wonderful afternoon, my, my library colleagues in the room know that I've spent the last 20 years of my career building archives very similar to the ones uh, to the one just described. And time and again, I am struck by the power of and the evo and the evocative reality of analog paintings. So um, Mo Mona's, if you will, analog paintings in the context of this digital, vast digital repository. I mean, just the striking resonance that that analog images continue to have. Um, never ceases to amaze me that one of the first archives I ever built had to do with Japanese American relocation camps. And the most striking images in them were paintings from the camps themselves. So um, with that, um, let me throw it open for questions. And remember, wait for a microphone, please. This question is for Mr. Lee. Uh, did we understand you to say that your grandfather um, um, Dancing Waters was uh, pregnant by your grandfather. <laughs> yeah. And and then if so, are you the descendant of Dancing Waters? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now you have to remember that um, in between the time from he was captured to we, that I had to write that story of what life might have been like, because all we know is when he was captured he, uh, and that uh, he was adopted by the Indian chief and he lived with him for two years. And they were in the teepee together. <laughs> <laughs> well, I figure that uh, if, if, I figure <laughs> that if he was adopted by the uh, chief, that he must have had special privileges, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Friends with privilege. We <laughs> well, so uh, uh, <laughs> so yeah, I, I may have to write a follow-up story of what happened to to their child uh, in down in the um, uh, reservations, you know, because that was some pretty awful times for for the uh, Native Americans. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, Su Fan Chang, who is a uh, professor from um, University of Nevada, has been doing uh, research that there's a, quite a bit yeah. of interaction between Chinese and Native Americans, and right. in particular, there's quite a bit of um, intermarriage in uh, Winnemucca, uh, and the Chinese, the Asian, the, the Indian community there uh, does not speak about their Chinese descendants, and the reason for that is because of the way the uh, blood quantum BIA system works. They don't want to let them know that there may be non-Indian blood, uh, um, you know, in, in their ancestry. So she has been quietly, carefully kind of yeah, digging out some I know of this. So <laughs> there was uh, somebody who wrote a... Uh, a thesis up in Seattle at a conference I went to about relationships with Native Americans and Chinese. And uh, it wasn't all conclusive one way or the other. In many instances, they got along very well. In other instances, they may have been killed along with everybody else that was killed that was 
say working on the railroad. Or, uh, mm -hmm. Yes, sir. <laughs> you mentioned, uh, sorry, I don't recall your name. Hel Helton. You had mentioned that uh, historians put very little faith in oral histories, and I found that to be interesting because I've had some contact with oral histories on a very limited scale. I thought maybe you could elaborate on that point. Well, um, not all historians, uh, but a, a lot of historians uh, feel that it's unreliable, uh, that uh, you need to have some kind of documentation to reinforce what someone says. Uh, without any maliciousness, people change their stories. Uh, and uh, you know, over, it's like playing telephone. You know, you know, it keeps on changing. You know, um, however, uh, we're taking the position that anything we can get is useful. Number one, and uh, as I said, we're interested in the fact that these are family and cultural memories of people today, and that in itself is valuable and a kind of evidence. This is how people identify themselves through that kind of uh, history. So um, so we don't take that kind of, nah, it's not. Some historians are very conservative that way, I mean, in terms of technique, methodology. Uh, back of the room on the right. Yeah, so I was wondering if you could comment on resources that the railroad museums. I'm aware the the one in Sacramento was mentioned. I'm aware that there's one in Carson City, a state uh, railroad museum. I've been to both. I was at uh, was in Sacramento recently and toured that museum. I've also taken. There's a beautiful train ride that goes from uh, San Francisco through that area on the way to Chicago. So I didn't encourage people well, to maybe take a, that trip sometime. There's a kind of excursion train, I mean, actually, a, you know, like a vacation train you can take, not just the Amtrak, but, you know, a separate kind of thing. Yeah, in our conference in April, we're going to um, actually, you know, God willing, uh, take our conference members to the trip to the Sierras. Um, well, we might lose some in the snow, but, um, you know, uh, if, if the weather allows us to, so that people who are working on this actually get that kind of visceral feeling. A lot of people have. Certainly the archaeologists have, because they work, in, in, and they're guiding us uh, in that way. So, yeah, we've got, we're, we're scouring every, you know, uh, Truckee, uh, Auburn. They all have little museums. And in fact, we sent, um, uh, we've been going to one of them, and they had all kinds of documents in Chinese. Mm -hmm. And they didn't know what they were. Yeah. So we had a little exchange. We, you know, we would take uh, photos, uh, give them, not word for word, but tell them this document is you know, a bill of or order for something, or this one is a letter to someone, right? So that they would know, and, and, and we would find things relevant. For example, we found a, a Chinese songbook written in traditional notation. Um, I had never seen that, and I didn't even know what that was. Um, and, um, you know, we don't know if it directly uh, related to the railroad, but it was of that time. So now we can get a sense of what songs they were singing, right? You know, uh, or enhance that uh, for what we know. So, yeah, valuable stuff. And then the other thing is around archives, the, uh, the, uh, Payroll records are in the uh, State Museum, and uh, we want to put it on digital archive, ancestry.com, uh, uh, you know, scan them, uh, and, uh, well, they won't let us use it because it's commercial, okay? And then we said, okay, this is the modern world. You say, they have a copyright on the scan. We'll go make our own scan. And the, the railroad museum said, go ahead, we'll help you, make your own scan, and it'll be public, okay? Uh, so that's a, you know, a, a way that we're collaborating with all those museums and things. We have time for one more question. Oh, too bad. Is there some idea of, of how many of the Chinese workers went back to China to live? Do you have an idea? 
No, I don't think no. we cannot <laughs> say anything with precision. Um, we do know that quite a few did go back. Uh, they went back and built those diallo, those, those houses, which are a combination of Chinese and Western architecture, and their towers to protect themselves from bandits and warlords. Uh, very interesting. Now, they're a world historic site now. Uh, so we know quite a few did go back. And in fact, quite a few went back and then came back to the US and went back and forth uh, a bunch of times. I think uh, your grandfather did that. He went back to China. <laughs> And then he came back. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so it's hard to tell. We do know, you know, quite a few people did stay, um, mm -hmm. whether they wanted to or not. Whatever the reason might be, but around all of the stuff, like the numbers of people working on such a such day, or we can't get, and we get conflicting information. So we're able to just to get kind of like a, an estimate. That's what makes do you want to add to it? Yeah. Uh, Alex, say something about. Uh, it wasn't necessarily a transcontinental railroad, but the California Southern Railroad that was built right here in San Diego. Do people know about that? A lot of Chinese worked on that, and a lot of them were hired by uh, Aquin, who was sort of the unofficial mayor of San Diego's Chinatown. And uh, then uh, one of the things that uh, was said, I think, by, well, they didn't want... Los Angeles and San Francisco didn't want us to build a railroad that would connect to the hinterland because they wanted, the Union Pacific wanted that railroad to be theirs. And, and, and so I think it was Leland Stanford that said, we have our foot on the neck of San Diego and we're going to keep it there. <laughs> That's our boy. <laughs> I think on, I think on that note, we're <laughs> <laughs> thanking our speakers again. <laughs>